All right, so thank you. Yes, today I will be talking about brain control. Now, of course, when you hear that phrase, you probably think of something like this, right? The mad scientist who wants to take over the world by manipulating the minds of the masses and so on. That's actually not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about a beneficial form of brain control. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit more about the brain. So your brain is this big. It weighs about three pounds, has the consistency of tofu, and it's responsible for an amazing uh, variety of different functions, cognition, attention, memory, perception, motor control, emotion, many different things. And one measure of its importance is that this little three-pound clump of tissue actually uses up 20% of all the oxygen that your body uses, which is pretty amazing. Now, I'll leave the brain here. Um, now, the brain is made up of cells called neurons, and there's 100 billion neurons in your brain. Okay, when numbers get that big, it's sometimes difficult to understand, you know, what is that? What does that mean? So to give you an, an idea, if you were to count the neurons one by one, say it takes you one second to count each one, it would take you over 3,000 years to count all the neurons just in a single brain. Another way of interpreting this, turns out on average, a human head has 100,000 hairs on it. Some people have less, some people have more, but on average, 100,000. <laughs> so if you were to count up the hairs on the heads of a million individuals, that's how many neurons you have in a single brain. Now these neurons connect to other neurons. In fact, each neuron connects to maybe 1,000 or up to 10,000, maybe even more uh, other neurons in what are called synapses. How many synapses are there? Turns out there's one quadrillion synapses, okay, an even bigger number. How big is that number? If you were to count the hairs on the heads of every person currently alive on Earth, you would still not quite reach that number. So th there's an amazing, amazing number of synapses in just a single brain. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about neurons. So neurons are cells, and they have interesting biophysical properties. But there's other ways of thinking about neurons. You can think of them as input-output devices. So there's inputs from other neurons. Then uh, within the neuron, there's some sort of crude processing that occurs, which leads to an output that then gets transmitted to other neurons. You can also think of neurons as components in electrical circuits, which is slightly simplified. There is chemistry going on as well. But it's useful to think of them that way because that means we can write down mathematical equations that describe the behavior of the neurons. And the brain control that I'm going to be talking about, it turns out it's an electrical stimulus. So thinking of them as electrical components allows us to understand how that stimulus affects their behavior. One last thing I want to mention about neurons is that they generate spikes. These are little blips of electrical activity they propagate down the axon to the dendrites. That causes a release of neurotransmitters that get taken up by other neurons, and that leads to the communication between the neurons. OK, so I'm going to be talking about brain control as applied to a treatment for Parkinson's disease. So let me tell you just a little bit about Parkinson's. Um, you're probably familiar. You might have family members that have Parkinson's or friends or you've seen on television. The most familiar symptom is the involuntary re resting tremor, typically in the arms, but um, often elsewhere. Now, neuroscientists have, neurosurgeons have made measurements of the neural activity for Parkinson's patients. And one interesting thing that they found is that there seems to be more synchronized neural activity in the motor control region of the brain. And that's, of course, the region that would be responsible for movement and so on. Now, that particular finding is already somewhat controversial, and the interpretation of it is, you know, not everybody agrees. But there is a hypothesis that this pathological synchronized neural activity may be responsible for some of the symptoms, such as tremor. How can we interpret this? Well, the way I like to think about it is, let's say that the neurons in the motor control region are behaving the way they should. They're firing at basically different times. Now, when they fire, they send a signal to other neurons, other brain regions. Ultimately, signals go to the muscle. If they're all coming at different times, these are a bunch of small signals that kind of get washed out. 
If, on the other hand, all the neurons are firing at the same time, then what will happen is you get a very strong signal which propagates to the muscle and tells it to contract. Now, if this happens over and over, it keeps contracting, you get tremor. Okay, so uh, there are various treatments for Parkinson's disease. Um, there are drug treatments that I'm not going to talk about. Instead, I'm going to talk about something called deep brain stimulation. So here in deep brain stimulation, a neurosurgeon, not me, okay, a neurosurgeon implants an electrode into the motor control region of the brain. There's also a pacemaker which is implanted in the patient's chest with a wire running between them. The pacemaker generates a high frequency pulsatile stimulus. This basically means 100 times a second, there's a little kick of electricity that goes to the electrode and into this region of the brain. Now, if it's done properly, if the neurosurgeon places it in the right place, and it turns out they have to be extremely precise, submillimeter accuracy, but if they place it in the right place and the signal is correct, it can make the symptoms of Parkinson's go away, or at least uh, be improved. Okay, so what is this doing? Well, a hypothesis, okay, again, the brain is complicated, not everybody agrees, but I have, I, a hypothesis is that this is leading to some desynchronization of the neural activity. So the way you could interpret this is, well, it's breaking up the possibility of these strong signals going to the muscles involuntarily and giving tremor. Now, deep brain stimulation is in common use. There are thousands of patients who have had it. It's really quite incredible, you know, when it gets turned on, it's almost immediate that the tremors go away. So you might say, okay, well, this seems like a done deal. Okay, why, why are you still thinking about this? Well, this is where the engineer in me comes out. Okay, first of all, the engineer in me says, hey, this is pretty cool. Okay, you're uh, injecting electricity in someone's brain, and it's actually a good thing. Um, but uh, as an engineer, I also think, well, could we do this better? Is there some other way to do the stimulus to get a better result? Or, well, it turns out there's a practical reason. The battery in the pacemaker that's implanted runs out after about two years of activity. And to replace it, you have to do surgery, which is expensive and has a risk of complication. So is there a better way to do the stimulus using less power, which would then help the battery to last longer, and ultimately you'd like it to last for the patient's entire lifetime? Okay, so um, using these hypotheses that we want to desynchronize neural activity, question. Can we come up with a better way of doing that? What I'm going to tell you about is an idea that we've been pursuing, which is to use something called chaos in order to desynchronize the neurons. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about chaos. Chaos is nicely illustrated by something called the butterfly effect. I'm guessing that many of you have heard of this before um, in movies or wherever. The idea behind the butterfly effect is let's consider two different scenarios related to the weather. In one scenario, Let's say we look at Brazil, and there happens to be a butterfly in Brazil that's just sitting there absorbing the sunlight, enjoying the views of Brazil, and in particular, not flapping its wings. OK, now let's look at something that seems completely unrelated. Let's go a couple weeks into the future and look at what the weather in Texas is. OK, and let's suppose in this first scenario that the weather's very nice, nice blue skies, no problems. OK, now go back in time. And for the second scenario, everything else is exactly the same, except now suppose the butterfly decides to flap its wings a few times. OK. Seems like that shouldn't have a big effect, right? But if a system is chaotic, which the weather is, that tells us that small disturbances can become bigger disturbances and bigger disturbances and so on. So in this scenario, the fact that the butterfly flapped its wings causes an eddy to form, a tiny eddy but maybe that interacts with other eddies that are there, and so on, the disturbance grows and grows, and then a couple weeks later in Texas, a hurricane is on the way. Okay, so chaos is this notion that, you know, two initial states can be very close to each other, but the chaos drives them apart, and so you get the difference between blue skies or a hurricane. Okay, what does this have to do with neurons and treating deep brain stimulation? Well. Remember, okay, the hypothesis is that we have pathological, uh, pathologically synchronized neural activity. That means that the states of the neurons are very similar to each other. The spikes are coming at roughly the same time. 
Now, if we can design an input that makes the system chaotic, then small changes in their behavior grow and grow, and ultimately you get something very different. So then the neurons are desynchronized. So this is the idea we've been pursuing. Okay, to give you an idea of how uh, one approaches a problem like this, we define a control objective. And in this case, there's actually two objectives that we want to satisfy. One, we want to minimize the amount of power that's being used by the pacemaker. Okay, this is so that the battery lasts longer. That's kind of the practical consideration. The second thing is we want to maximize the butterfly effect. We want the stimulus to be as effective as possible at desynchronizing these neurons, okay? So we can mathematically write down an expression for this control objective, do some fancy mathematics, and out pops an optimal control stimulus. So this would be the best possible stimulus that one could design in order to meet this control objective. So we've done this on the computer. What I'm showing here is some results of a simulation. There's three neurons represented by the three dots. They start out with dynamics very similar to each other and all spiking at about the same time. But the control is being applied over and over. And what that does is it causes the behavior of this, these neurons to separate. And so we get desynchronization where they're all spiking at different times. Now, we've done this, of course, for more than three neurons. This is just uh, to illustrate. And the results are extremely promising. And in fact, so promising, we're now working with an experimentalist who's trying to implement these control algorithms using real neurons. But it turns out we can do even better than this. So here, what I showed you, the stimulus kept being applied over and over. But you can imagine, let's say that there's another probe in this region of the brain which detects how synchronous that activity is. If it's already desynchronized, you don't need to apply the stimulus. Okay, you can save the juice in your battery for when you actually need it. So with this additional probe, the idea is if they start to synchronize again, then you turn on the control, desynchronize them, and use it only as needed. So our computational results suggest that by using uh, the algorithm that I've described, you can desynchronize the population using about 100 times less power, perhaps even less, um, but 100 times less power than using traditional deep brain stimulation with the pulsatile stimuli. So that's pretty cool. Okay, now there are other pos possible applications for brain control. Okay, so consider epilepsy, for example. There are two different scenarios that may be of interest. One, well, suppose that a patient is undergoing a seizure. Wouldn't it be great if you could then stimulate in such a way to terminate the seizure quicker than it would on its own devices? Okay, that would definitely be a great thing. Or even better, suppose you can detect that a seizure is about to occur and you stimulate the brain in order to prevent it from happening at all, okay? Um, another place that the brain control is used is treatments for depression. Here I'm talking about very debilitating depression, but neurosurgeons have identified which region of the brain to target with deep brain stimulation, and by stimulating, they're able to lift the patients out of their depressions. And you don't have to limit yourself to the brain. Okay, the heart also has electrical properties, and so you can stimulate the heart to treat cardiac arrhythmias. Here, a dream of mine, and we're certainly not there yet, but a dream of mine is, you know, if somebody is having a heart attack, you get the paddles out and you zap them really hard, and you hope the heart starts beating properly again. Now, sometimes it works, and that's great, but it turns out the shock is so large that it can damage the heart tissue. So even if the patient survives, their heart is weakened. Wouldn't it be great if you could come up with a better stimulus that's at least as effective as shocking it, but uses much less power and therefore doesn't damage the heart tissue. As I say, we're not there yet, but we're thinking along those lines. And it turns out you can use very similar mathematical and engineering principles in order to address these other applications as well. Um, it turns out for the cardiac system, typically you want to synchronize the activity rather than desynchronizing it. You want all of the cells sort of uh, contributing in phase with each other in order to make the heart beat the same way. But as I say, you can use similar principles. Okay, so I'm not going to make the claim that we have a superior treatment for Parkinson's disease, at least not yet. 
But we're working in that direction, and not just us. There's other researchers around the world that are thinking about these sorts of problems. And I think that there's a real opportunity at the intersection of these fields, the fields of neuroscience, medicine, mathematics, engineering. And um, so I want to close by saying brain control is here. Brain control can be beneficial. And brain control, it's not just for the mad scientists anymore. So thank you. <laughs>